three. So go ahead. Welcome everyone from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Today we are going to talk about the stragglers, the insecurities in the 21st century. And I am Daniela Bass, the director of the Division for Inclusive Social Development in DESA. And I'm very happy to give very short welcoming remarks to all of you who are attending the meeting today. And particular thanks to Nancy Birdsell for accepting our invitation to participate in this webinar series. As you all know, in 2020, the United Nations and the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs worked quickly uh, to focus on the unprecedented crisis posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. As part of the United Nations system's response to the pandemic, the department is closely monitoring the social and economic impacts of the crisis. And the pandemic has exposed the precarity of life for many people, revealing the larger degree of risk embodied in today's societies. Many of the social groups that fall within the mandate of our division for inclusive social development, and I mean older persons, persons with disabilities, youth, indigenous peoples, older persons, as I said, and the family where all generations meet, well, they're more vulnerable to and disproportionately exposed to the virus and less able to cope the negative economic and social consequences of this pandemic. In this sense, economic insecurity intersects with inequality and poverty to form a critical triangle of today's most urgent societal challenges. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Nancy Bertsall, who is joining us to discuss the plight of the strugglers, the billions of economically insecure people who live just above poverty, but far away from economic security. And I will pass now the floor to Ms. Marta Roig, who is in the division I lead, and an exceptionally excellent um, uh, senior staff who will moderate today's discussion. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela, and hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Birzel. Dr. Birzel needs little introduction to many of us. She's the President Emeritus and a Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, DC. Before she uh, launching the center, she worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She is also been executive vice president of the Inter-American Development Bank and worked for many years at the World Bank in different positions. She, uh, she, works, she has published extensively and works on many topics, um, including global governance and international financial institutions, women's empowerment and its relationship to reproductive choices. But her presentation today is about um, struggling, insecurity, and issues of the middle class as well, I believe. So, uh, with uh, just a few housekeeping, uh, housekeeping rules before passing the floor on to Nancy. Nancy will speak for about 20 or 25 minutes, um, and then we will open the floor for questions and answers. You can write your questions in the Q&A box that is on the right-hand side of, of your screen. If you don't have the, the box open, you can open it through the command center that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can post your questions during the presentation, but if it's okay with Nancy, I'd rather, unless there's a very pressing question, I would rather ask the questions, which I will have to ask myself at the end of her presentation. So without further ado, uh, Nancy, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Daniela and Marta. I think Daniela put it very well. Uh, the COVID-19 has exposed the precarity of life. And for that reason, I think there are many lessons from uh, before the time of COVID for greater attention in the developing community to a group of people that I call strugglers. So now, I am going to try to put up by sharing content, but 
Amin, I think you are going to have to put it up. It's not happening. When I hit shared content, can you can you yes. hear? Yes, I hear you. So let me I don't know why. Not there. It's okay. So you'll go to slideshow. Okay, so I'm here. <laughs> So thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture for everyone of a gentleman. I hope some of you remember Mohammed Bouazizi. He is the gentleman who immolated himself in Tunisia in December 2011, uh, triggering the Arab Spring. And I got interested in Mohammed Bouazizi because it was very clear that he did not consider himself and was not poor by the international poverty line, the standard one of something like $1.90 a day. He was a vegetable vendor. He gave away to the poor, often weekly, when he had leftovers, and in general, uh, he was trying to put his sister through secondary school. He was, in many respects, what I would call a struggler. He immolated himself, apparently, because he was being harassed by the police. He was, felt it was very unjust. He resisted either paying a bribe or getting a license he didn't really need to have, whatever it was. Um, he was frustrated. He was anxious. But he was not poor. His income was probably around the income of his household probably around three to five dollars a day. So he was in the insecure, precarious, to go back to Daniela's remarks, uh, struggler group. Next slide. So in this talk, I'm going to say a little bit more about strugglers and where we get this classification, some of their characteristics, comment on the implications for governance in developing countries, and then go to lessons from and implications for COVID. Next slide. So this is a figure that you may hear about. I understand that Lopez Calva might be doing a webinar in the future for DESA. And this is from a paper of his from some years ago. And don't worry about trying to figure it out. Basically, <laughs> It's saying that if you are at $6 a day income in these countries when the studies were done that are the basis for this figure, you had more than a 40% chance of falling back into below $4 poverty. Uh, only by $10 a day per person in a household was there only a 10% chance of falling back into poverty. So, Lopez Calva's work was based on uh, looking at household shocks for households. You know, uh, per, the adult, a key working adult loses her job in the household, or a child is sick and many days of work are lost. Those are household shocks. Uh, obviously, Buazizi's household had a major shock, but it was just a household shock. The issue with COVID-19 in developing countries and in the rich world indeed, is that we're talking about what amounts to a macro shock. So that's something to keep in mind. Let's go to the next slide. So this is a little bit of deep background, but to keep in mind because many people, I hope on this webinar, are familiar with the idea that the World Bank has now recognized that poverty is relative. So that if you live in a lower middle income country, $3.20 is now the poverty line. And if you live in an upper middle income country, it's $5.50. And this chart shows that for high income countries, more or less the po so-called poverty line is as high as $21 or almost $22. That's background. It's the beginning, I hope, of a recognition in the development community that the $1.90 line is, is not real in terms of our understanding of the true meaning of being poor uh, in the larger sense of the world word. Next slide. 
So let's just look at the facts. They're already getting outdated, but in 2013, 60% of people in the developing world were in this category of four to $10 struggler category. And projections uh, in about 2017 that we did at the Center for Global Development, where I come from, suggested that will still be true in 2030. That is because the lack of change is because some strugglers, one hopes with growth, would move into the middle class above $10, and some poor would move into the struggler group. But the key point is that most people in the developing world are in the four to $10 group. Next slide. And so what's happened, this is just a picture that shows um, the, the orange line of strugglers uh, has changed. And at the same time, the middle class, both have grown and will continue to grow. At least that was what we thought at the time until 2030. Next slide. Both have doubled. Most strugglers live in middle income countries, mostly lower middle income and upper middle income as well. Uh, you'll see that very few strugglers, relatively few, it's a lot of people, but uh, live in low income countries because uh, in low income countries, the very poor dominate. Next slide. So to give you a feel at the level of um, countries, what you see here is that in a country like India, uh, the poor plus the strugglers amount to 90% of all people. The $10 a day middle class is still just 10%. It's a little bit higher and a little bit different in Indonesia. So we're living in a world dominated by people suffering from precariousness or insecurity. Next slide. Uh, this group is the dominant group in the Asian lower middle income countries. Only when you get to the level of income per capita of say Thailand in Asia, do you have a middle class that is larger. Um, and in Brazil, a middle class that's approaching, what is it here, 50% of the population. But most of these countries to the left, even countries like we think of say Sri Lanka, and the Philippines have plenty of people who are the majority of the population in the struggler group. Next slide. So key characteristics. I don't think any listeners who follow development issues will be surprised. Most strugglers are urban and peri-urban. It's the very poor who are concentrated now in rural areas. They have primary schooling, sometimes more not secondary. I think most important, they're very heavily concentrated as informal workers. That informal is the new normal through 2030. This is an expression from an ILO document some years ago. And we can assume, although I don't have a good measure of it, that strugglers have high expectations because they have, there are more of them and most of them have seen at the household level increases in income in the last 10, 15 years, but they also live highly stressed lives. And I mention here a book by Mula Nathan on scarcity that some of you may be familiar with, how stress and anxiety can actually affect people's decisions about even uh, their ability to make decisions in their own short-term, long-term interest. Next slide. So don't, let's not try to figure out this slide, it's kind of complicated, but it's demonstrating that stru strugglers, for the most part, have completed primary education, and it's middle-class people now living in households with income per capita of $10 or more, who are mostly those where the adults have completed secondary education. Next slide. And most strugglers 
seem to work in sectors between agriculture and formal sector jobs. Again, not useful here to figure out um, what this slide is actually telling you, the graphs, but I don't think people should be surprised that we're talking about people who are out of agriculture, but not in, in, in formal sector jobs. Next slide. This is a uh, slide from an ILO document. Um, and what it suggests is that most strugglers are not surprisingly, as I already said, in the inform they're informal workers without a regular pay stub. So insecurity in every everywhere in the world is, is somewhat associated with not having a pay stub. Um, I think it's this report that made the point that the informal is the new normal in the 21st century. And that is certainly true for those of you from uh, the rich world. Many Americans, I hope, are listening. Uh, we are now in, an, in a sort of setup in the U.S. where many fewer people than in the 20th century have a regular pay stub. Stay, pay stub. Many more people are Uber drivers or contract workers or work for McDonald's and other and uh, Walmart where they're not sure week to week how many hours of work they'll be they'll be able to have. Next slide. And this group of informal workers makes up 90% of all workers outside of agriculture in Indonesia. That's one of the things that this slide is telling you. Next slide. Sorry, I have to correct that a little bit. In Indonesia, if you combine the extreme poor and the strugglers, they make up 90% of informal workers. So this, this is a, a picture many of you may be familiar with that Bronko Milanovic developed some years ago. And the orange are the strugglers. And you can see along the bottom horizontal line that they are people in this picture between $2 and 10 cents a day and $9 and 40 cents a day. So it's the more or less the two to 10 or four to $10 group. And this is the group because the bars are very high. The, this graph is showing that they had the highest uh, got the greatest benefits from growth, relatively greatest benefits from growth between 1990 and 2011. And that was true as well since. And I'm emphasizing this because it illustrates the reality of a group of people with high expectations. They have been accustomed to living in a world in which life is getting better and they can hope for a better life for their own children. Next slide. Uh, I think I'll skip this. It's basically modifying the story I just told you. Maybe strugglers have not been such great, the greatest beneficiaries. But you see the same thing on the far right. Now it's not an elephant, it's something else. Um, it's some other creature that it's the rich who have the at the far to right of the graph who have benefited most from growth in the last 10, 20 years. And I think this is now a very much accepted fact with Piketty and others writing on inequality that we, we see this emerging problem more and more. But the strugglers have done well. That's the, the message, relatively well. Um, so they're now facing the kind of stress and anxiety that the middle class and working class the lower middle class and working class in the US are facing. Next slide. So now just a word on why this size and expectations and insecurity and precarity of the struggler group matters for those of you who are interested in questions of long-term development. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So we hear a little, I'm going to say a few things about the middle class here in contrast to the strugglers, as Daniela suggested. And this is a well known quotation from Aristotle that it is manifest that the best political community is formed by citizens of the middle class. Um, that tends to, he associated a large middle class with a well administered state. Next slide. So let me go back to Aristotle for a minute. We can leave this slide up. It's a very simple, probably oversimplified view of what makes development happen. But I'm using it here to illustrate how important understanding this struggler group and addressing their needs is. That in the apps, what a middle class brings in a developing country is two related things. One is sufficient household income to be able to pay taxes. In contrast to the poor, who fortunately in many countries now actually receive cash transfers from the government. So they are net beneficiaries of government, let's call it largesse. Uh, so that's the first characteristic of middle class is that they can, in principle, afford to pay taxes, whether it's the VAT, personal income tax, whatever it is. And the second characteristic that's associated with tax paying is having the time to make government, make the state accountable. It's easier to think of this as something that matters at the local level, at least. But more generally, the act of paying taxes gives people, in principle, a lever to push for accountability from the, uh, from the governments. So here you see that struggler, this is a picture of struggler countries because we're talking here about country level development progress. And you, we can think of struggler countries as those that have a sufficiently large middle class by some crude measure. And what this picture is saying is that only a few upper middle income countries have a middle class percentage as high as say 40%. Most lower middle income countries and lower income countries have very small middle classes, despite a lot of the hoopla in the last 10 years. Um, I don't think I said it, one of the pictures that I showed you, charts that I showed you a few minutes ago, suggests and other research that I did at the center a few years ago suggests that India's middle class is very large in terms of absolute number of people, but it's probably still only 10 to 15 percent of the entire population in India. Okay, so India is a poor country. Many of these countries are between poor and struggler countries. Next slide. Here we go, taxes and state accountability. When is the middle class large enough? What happens when it declines? These are really big questions. It's not clear and there's no simple answer. But I think, you know, Chile now probably has a middle class. It shows here is relatively small, but it's probably up to 50 or 60 percent. And that gives Chile as a country a certain resilience. Brazil, despite its current troubles, has a certain resilience that countries like uh, Indonesia, uh, India don't have, Nigeria don't have in the long run. Next slide. Uh, this is just a picture of tax revenues to capture the point I was making. Um, it's amazing, actually, you know, I don't think people think of it often enough who think about development, that annual tax revenues per capita are about $260 in India. They're $1,700 in Mexico and $13,000 per person in OECD countries. So, in the world of COVID, think of it as most developing countries are relatively starved for fiscal space to address the rising needs 
of their populations with the pandemic. Next slide. And this is going on about who's paying taxes. The median taxpaying voter in Brazil is a struggler, not someone in the middle class. Again, orange color is showing you where the struggle, strugglers are in terms of per capita income, uh, which is on the horizontal axis at the bottom. So you see there between about four and ten dollars, the distribution of Brazilians at four dollars, five dollars, and so on. Next slide. That was in 2009. It's different now. This just shows you that strugglers actually pay taxes. They are uh, my colleague and co-author on a struggler paper, Nora Lustig, makes the point with very interesting data she's collected for many countries now that um, strugglers are immiserized in some respects by the tax system. That is, they are payers into the system, not beneficiaries of it, despite their relative poverty. Next slide. And here we have Indonesia, where the median tax paying voter, tax paying question mark voter is poor. And then I think we have India. Next slide. Where that situation is even more stark. So, I mean, how am I doing on time? Should I be finishing to allow time? Marta, to hi, Nancy. This is Marta. Um, you are doing okay. You still have a good five minutes if you want to use them for Great. and a half right now. <laughs> okay, let's go to the most, um, at least, timely subject, part four of the presentation in the next slide. Strugglers and COVID. And here I've tried to bring out, um, not adequately, but given it a try, lessons from and implications of understanding the developing world as populated primarily by people who are either poor or struggling. Maybe another way to think of strugglers is what I'd like to say is the new poor of the 21st century. Now that we've recognized that going from $1.90 to $1.91 a day is not escaping poverty. The escape from poverty has something to do with moving beyond insecurity and anxiety and stress in various dimensions of life. So strugglers and COVID lessons from implications of. We have here is a picture that uh, we found from the Pew Research Center which is a picture of the distribution of income across the entire world by income. And you see there that most people in the world live insecure, anxious lives. About one third, obviously concentrated in the developing world, are poor or strugglers. At least this it, concentrated in the developing world pre-COVID. Now, I think we have some numbers in absolute terms that are beginning to matter in countries like the U.S. with poor safety net and poor social insurance and so on. So, next slide. So, now we've put together a uh, try to use existing updates of income per capita among countries from the IMF and the World Bank to make this chart. And I think it's not necessarily to try and unpack it entirely, but let me try to tell you in words what it's saying. Um, in this chart, the blue, starting at the bottom, the portion that is blue shows you the number of people under the international poverty line. And then in black, the additions to that number associated in just recent months with the pandemic. So 
you see about 100 million, 70 to 100 million more people below the international poverty line. The next line up for lower middle income countries suggests from World Bank data primarily about 177, it's not an about, about 200 million more people living below 320 a day. Another 200 million people in upper middle income countries living below 550 a day. And a crude estimate of perhaps 100 million more people joining the struggler group having fallen out of the secure middle class in the last four or five months. So it adds up to as many as 400 million new strugglers and 100 million new extreme poor. These are big numbers as a proportion of the global population. Next slide. So this is a little bit wrong. Well, lessons from and implications of, but I'll struggle through as a struggler. Uh, COVID reminds us of the premium on social insurance, social safety net, cash transfers, universal basic income, child grants, automatic stabilizers, the importance of these approaches in every country in the world. That's first. And second, in the long run, it reminds us, and there's a lot of discussion of this for those of you reading about the controversy in the United States among economists and philosophers, in the long run, it may not be enough to improve in the distribution of income through, dis through greater distribution from the government. It may be critical to improve the market distribution of income by increasing opportunities, by sharing empowerment, by re-empowering unions, for example, and by going back to the point about Bouazizi of the justice or injustice of systems at the structural level. And on democracy and politics and government, the ability of countries to manage, to do collective action around increasing, empowering, shared empowerment, uh, developing the sort of micro policies listed above. Okay, next slide. Think of it at the mac thinking of it at the macro level, uh, there's no question, and this is certainly relevant for the work of DESA, that with COVID, begin given that most people in the world are strugglers, COVID responsive policies matter for global economic and financial stability. And the implication of that is the need for massive international support now. And it's very troubling, frankly, if you think of the world as strugglers to observe what's going on, which is that there are there is good talk. For example, the G20 has announced a debt standstill on at least um, uh, country official country debt for the, on behalf of developing countries. But that, that initiative is going, moving very slowly, maybe even stalled. The IMF, there's been much discussion of a new issue of uh, special drawing rights. Um, I've written a little bit about that, and I've written about why not again sell or mobilize IMF gold to help lower income countries deal with their debt problems right now. As their GDP falls, it's even harder for them to cover the debt uh, service that they owe. That the multilateral development banks, particularly the World Bank, sweat the cap their capital more to increase their ability to do concessional flows, more concessional flows, more lending, um, a debt standstill or forgiveness if their net flows cannot be managed quickly enough. I think that's a big challenge for a place like the World Bank. They'd like to get net flows up, but the traditional problems of bureaucracy 
and interactions with developing countries. Well, we'll see if it can be managed absent sort of a larger, broader approach. And there is a trade-off in the short run between focusing on aid effectiveness um, and reducing hunger. And then among rich country donors, um, it's time to increase aid and that seems, the likelihood of that seems tough at the moment. But it's time to increase aid as enlightened self-interest in a world where responding to the desperate needs of millions of people in developing countries right now matters for global economic and financial stability in the long run. So that's the macro side. Next slide. Micro policies, many of you will be familiar with these. Um, I invite you to look over them, but what is the future of work when informality is normal? How to make informal work more productive? The problem of social insurance for workers without pay stubs, going beyond cash transfers, beyond indirect taxes like the VAT to progressive tax policy in developing countries, far more emphasis on taxing property, capital, and personal income. The need for automatic stabilizers, cross subsidies, if and when there is another initiative in some countries to increase prices of energy and water, given that these are scarce global goods, uh, short-term transfers to strugglers, et cetera. Some of this comes from pre a pre-struggler, a pre-COVID list. Um, focus any universal basic income and distribution of natural resource rents on strugglers too. I mean, some of the message here for me or from me is strugglers are poor. They are the new poor of this century. Next slide. Amin, or next slide. Yes, one second. Is this okay? Sorry. Oh, no, skip that. That's in the wrong order. Keep going. Nope, go back. Okay. What happened? <laughs> we lost some. Here we are. Let's go to, yeah, role of rich world countries. Uh, so these are very general remarks. Go beyond aid to a just global system. This is what the rich countries have to attend to. Tax evasion, legal tax dodges that matter for developing countries and non-aid policies. And then new lessons from COVID that need to be internalized, uh, which I've just said in a way, the new poor vulnerable people should count as poor uh, invest much more in global health security. I've written recently about this with my colleague Amanda Glassman by a WHO and all other public goods, especially climate. And now maybe we go back. Let's see what the next slide is. I wanted to end with the UN. Excellent, thank you. So, you know, I think the United Nations is absolutely fundamental to uh, the work of engaging more people in the world to be global citizens in support of SDGs, global collective action, international NGOs, supporting independent think tanks, in order for more people to understand this basic message of so many people in the world are living precarious, insecure lives. So let me end with the development agenda is a global agenda. And that's the message that comes from the UN and now reminds me of the importance of the UN in shaping people's norms and attitudes. And that's true pre, mid and post COVID. And I hope the next slide says thank you very much. Thank you. Please remember Mohammed Bouazizi's sister. She is still out there, I hope, finishing secondary education so she can enter the middle class. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nancy, for this uh, very rich and evidence-based presentation. There are so many takeaways from the presentation that it would be impossible for me to make justice to it. Um, maybe just a, a couple of my own. The world was dominated by, pre by precariousness even before um, the COVID crisis hit. So the crisis has just exposed what was already before um, there. Then that the median taxpaying voter in many parts of the world is actually a struggle, not a member of the perhaps more secure middle class, and that taxes make strugglers poorer in many parts of the world. Linked to that maybe the fact that systemic tax, such as COVID, uh, remind us of the importance of having autom automatic stabilizer in, in place in, in responsive uh, social protection systems. Um, and then in terms of the UN, I would highlight your uh, quote about the, the UN's important role in promoting the idea of global citizenship. Um, so without further ado, we can go to the, the Q&A. And while we wait for questions to come in, um, maybe Daniela, you have some, I have a couple myself. Um, okay, one would be in terms of the strugglers. So um, escaping, becoming a struggler because you have escaped poverty is different from struggling, be belonging to the middle class and becoming a struggler because of a shock, be it individual or systemic. Um, I suppose the two have different political consequences, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those. A link to that is the fact that is the middle class, you have defined the middle class as economically secure. Can we still define the, all the middle class as economically insecure, uh, or have some parts of the middle class experience more insecurity over the past case? And even more recently, I'll stop here and I'll let you answer. And then from here on, if you're okay, we'll take several questions at the same time. Yes, that's fine. Uh, so I, I don't think I can account in everything about what you're asking, Marta, but thank you for your excellent summary. Um, I think what's important about COVID is that it's a macroeconomic shock. We know that household shocks are what affect strugglers and their risk of falling back to even lower income than they already have. Macro shocks like this COVID and the economic fallout are going to affect what I was calling the relatively secure middle class. And as you had suggested with your question, that can have very um, complicated political effects. Uh, particularly in countries where the middle class is relatively small already. So I did have a picture in the PowerPoint of kind of protest. Uh, I don't know if the, the participants remember that. And that was a protest in Brazil sometime around 2013, 2014, when bus fares were raised. And who knows how many of those protesters were over the $10 line and how many were under the $10 line. Uh, but it's sort of cap, it's certainly if you're under the $10 line, an increase in bus fares can have a relatively large percentage kind of effect on your, your well being in terms of other consumption, food and rent and so on. So sometimes it's a good effect politically that comes and sometimes it's too disruptive. It depends so much on other contingencies, including what government is in place and how the leadership deals with the government. Thanks so much, Nancy. So I, I mean, are there questions? I cannot see them. Yes, we have a question from Simone Cecchini, I think, uh, from a regional commission. Uh, do you see them, Marta? Do you see one? No, I, I don't see uh, any. It says, can we talk of middle class solely on the basis of an income classification? This is a question for Nancy. Well, other, of course, there are, I think, 
the way to answer that question is to go back to the characteristics of a class of people who are at $10 and above in developing countries. And remember that they are more likely to have pay stubs, right? To have regular work that's that with secure income. They're very likely to be have at least secondary education. Um, I can't remember what else. So it's crude. There's something crude about it, but there's it's no more crude than saying that people pass out escape poverty at a dollar and 91 cents a day. So it's an effort to use data we have to help clarify what the world is like and what people's lives are like who are in different income categories. And you can always argue that there's more to poverty than being below $1.90 a day in terms of uh, infant mortality, life expectancy, failure to have education, and so on. And I think you can say the same thing about any income category. So we can only forgive ourselves for using this approach to try to understand the world better. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Um... I can I can still not see the questions. I mean, I'm afraid you'll have to ask them. Yeah, I think we have only one for now. We are still waiting for more, but you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so do you think that the middle class is as secure now as it was um, 50 years ago, economically? I've thought about this in the context of the US. And the answer is definitely not as secure. So I think you make a good point indirectly with your question, Marta, that there have been dramatic changes in the world in the last 50 years that have made more people less secure, materially speaking. The one that is most discussed in a general way is, in quotation marks, globalization. That so many people understand globalization as having had disastrous effects on the middle class in the US. I think it's an, oh, that is, is more complicated than such a statement suggests because we know well that the effects of globalization in Germany and Denmark have been much less harmful. So clearly the difference for the US has something to do with the approach to social safety net, social insurance, opportunity in general, the existence of huge differences uh, across races. Uh, so, you know, you can't generalize without, for any one society. I think there is, gen it is true that with more globalization, many countries have responded by increasing their focus on what we could broadly call social insurance. And that that makes sense. So if we are to have a world that is knit together globally, we must have a world in which governments are more able and capable and politically empowered by their populations to increase the focus on reasonable amount of material security for people. Thanks so much. Not now we, I, I can see some questions. Okay. I can see some, not all of them, but um, I think I can only see those that are uh, asked to all participants. But I'll go. I cannot them. talk. Can I? Anybody sure. hears me? Yes. Ah, fantastic. Sorry, I thought I, I was trying to operate my mic. Can I ask a question? Of course. Right. Um, at the beginning, in the welcoming remarks, Nancy. 
I'm, we, we said that uh, vulnerable groups of the society and that also belong to middle, middle class, uh, to the middle class, uh, some of them at least, um, but, you know, and particularly discriminated or finding more challenges than others are indigenous peoples uh, or persons with disabilities. So when it comes to uh, uh, belong, I don't like the word belonging, but having a disability or being older or being an indigenous person who lives in the middle class, who belongs to that class. Um, but there is a double, if you wish, discrimination. Um, so there is, a, and, and, and definitely the inequalities here are not only economic, uh, but they are also uh, social. So there are many, many different elements to be, to considered, uh, to be taken into consideration now. And uh, next year, the Commission for Social Development will focus about um, uh, social development and the digital technologies. We do know that lots of uh, new um, employments and jobs in the new market and the first industrial revolution are in uh, digital technologies. And so this will have an impact also on the economic and the income of uh, middle class people. So uh, is there anything that we could uh, take into consideration when thinking of the role of digital technologies in somehow enhancing the well-being of some groups of people and facilitating their employment, if, if you wish? On the other hand, uh, how the human capital vis-a-vis -vis the economic capital uh, can, can, can be enhanced and, uh, and thanks also to the use of digital technologies. I do not know if it is, it, I, I was clear in my question. Um, well, I think it's fantastic that there is this upcoming Commission for Social Development that's looking at digital technologies. I, I mean, your question, I'm not sure what it was exactly, whether it was a critique of who's in the middle class. I suppose it goes back to the point that using dollars a day per capita is a very crude classification, but at the macro level across societies, it teaches us a lot. That's, that's the point of thinking about strugglers. So the question from a data point of view is, well, how many indigenous people are in the middle class in what countries and why? What is it about the country, political and economic environment that has enabled people with pre-existing disadvantages to enter the middle class? So, you know, if you are following the US literature now, the reality that for blacks and for Latin groups and for Native Americans, they're not as there aren't as many proportionately who are already in a middle class. Maybe that's the easiest way to address. So your question has to do with not the implications of understanding a world where there are so many strugglers and poor, but what to do about it. So I'm sure this, this commission will focus on that. We um we have little time now. We have a lot of questions, but we have five minutes. Nancy, can I ask you at least two questions? Sure. From the audience. Okay. One is um have you observed the relationship between levels of inequality in a country and the precariousness of strugglers? And what are the policies to address this relationship? That's one question. Um, another one is there's a, a literature documenting the stress and insecurity of the middle class. Other than income level, what are what is the main difference between the middle class and strugglers other than income level? Let's take these two and then we can see if there's time for more. Okay, so I think it's a wonderful question, relationship between levels of inequality and strugglers. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, India has a relatively low Gini coefficient and most of its population is poor or struggling. So, you know, there's no simple relationship in the way we currently measure inequality. But if you go in the other direction, 
is inequality associated with a higher probability of insecurity in, the, in a population, then the answer is obvious that it is. And I think in the case of inequality, the additional dimension has to do with the level crudely of justice in, a, in an economy. And that's why I say, try to think back to the situation of Bouazizi. I think strugglers as a group are in most countries equally vulnerable to the failures of unjust systems. So when there are a lot of strugglers and poor for a given per capita income, the obvious example is oil rich economies like Nigeria, then it's time to ask questions about the level of injustice, systemic injustice in one form or another. But ultimately, it depends on the country. I guess that's the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And the second question was differences between the middle class and strugglers besides income. Yes. So I would return. I'm not sure what the person has in mind who asked the question. I'd sort of be curious. Mm -hmm. Let me let me just give you a hint that the first sentence was there's a literature documenting the stress and insecurity of the middle class. So it may be on issues of health. Um, yeah. You mentioned education. Um, yeah, maybe because exactly. right, maybe because I'm an economist, <laughs> I kind of have trouble resisting the fact that having more money is empowering. Having more money enables people, whatever, however bad the health system is, you're better off with more money. <laughs> so you're better off if you're middle class than if you're poor or the new working poor. But we know that from the data that being middle class is also associated with likelihood of at least secondary education. It's associated with having a formal sector job with a regular pay stub. So we, you know, the larger picture is quite clear that there is a very straightforward relationship on average. Of course, there are exceptions. You have people who are graduate students who look poor in the data, but they have college education. So their lifetime income is bound to be above $10 a day or in rich countries above 25 or $30 a day. Um, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, Nancy, we've taken a lot of your time. There would be more questions, but I suppose we have to stop both because you've been speaking for an hour and I mean, I suppose we have to stop also. Because Yes, I like very much if you can keep the, the questions in the chat box for me, because okay. I, I'm sorry I took so long that there wasn't enough time for questions. I always find the questions to be the, the most interesting part of learning itself. Your presentation was extremely interesting and insightful. Uh, so thanks so much, Nancy, for having taken the time and for sharing the presentation with us. Um, I, I think Daniela maybe wants to say, uh, to give some closing. Daniela, you, you're muted. Daniela um, can speak now, yeah. Yeah, thank you. They mute and unmute me depending. Um, I would like to invite uh, all those who uh, attended this uh, webinar, uh, many, I have to say, um, to um, follow Nancy's invitation and uh, we would be very happy to collect the questions and uh, provide them to you. And um, if, if, uh, if there are any specific topics that we would like to discuss in the future, Marta, uh, maybe we could again invite Nancy on, on, a, an, on another specific topic. Um, and uh, if we receive enough uh, questions and answers, they could even be packaged, but it's just a suggestion, into a technical paper, something that can be distributed also online for further conversations and discussions. Who knows? It could even become a forum. 
because it is a very important what we have been discussing today. In security, it is something that impacts all of us in one way or another. And as long as we live in, 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 in fear or in reality, in insecurity, um, this also um, impacts, not necessarily in a positive way, on the contrary, one of the three pillars of the United Nations. Actually, I would say the three pillars of the UN, peace and security. Mm -hmm. So insecurity can cause many stressful situations within a country of different, of, of a nature that we don't necessarily like, where violence could be triggered and so on. The other pillar is human rights, the right to live in dignity. And the third pillar that is the pillar where DESA is and our division is, is the pillar of development. We have 17 goals ahead of us. And our role is to, to provide a sound policy advice and norms uh, and suggestions uh, and solutions to member states on how to overcome the present crisis that like a cascade started from a, a health perspective, but actually is touching all dimensions. And, um, and so we needed to develop strong policies and enable governments and countries to have strong national policy frameworks in place. Um, so this would also facilitate the acceleration and the implementation of the 17 goals of the 2030 agenda. And, um, and therefore, I think that there is plenty of work ahead of us. And through the lens of economy, we can look also at, at, at the other dimensions, the social, the environmental, the cultural, and the political. So thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you to all of you at the UN in DESA. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.